imagine a vehicle that gets 100 miles to the gallon? How about 1,000 miles to gallon? Well, we can, and our students can too. In 2007-2008, I heard about a competition that would allow our students to try to tackle this seemingly overwhelming goal. Now, the typical approach would have been to get some students together, give them tasks, and off they go. We took a slightly different approach. We found five young students that it, we could work with personally. And we basically invested ourselves and our time into them. And what came of that was the blue diamond. Okay. What's supposed to show up is a blue vehicle. And there's there supposed to be a number up there that says <laughs> 430 miles per gallon. And so you might look at that and say, wow, 430 miles per gallon. I would love to get 430 miles per gallon, especially with gas at four bucks a gallon. But that, that is completely impractical. I can't get any of my legs in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right. But one of the things that came out of this project was that we energized a group of students that wanted to tackle real problems. Following the success of this vehicle, we basically made a strategic move that we would compete in the urban concept division within the Eco Marathon. What this was, this was an urban vehicle that was basically a low speed vehicle, meaning it can go 35 miles an hour or under. It was also a single seater vehicle. But the fun thing about it was not that we were building it for fuel economy, but the fact that now we were going to build something that people really wanted. And it looked cool because basically it married together function as well as aesthetics. Over the last five years, our team has continually built some of the most competitive as well as some of the most appealing vehicles. In the first year that we competed in the urban concept division, we created a vehicle that we named Bavetti. It got second place with 150 miles per gallon, and that vehicle served as the poster vehicle for the international competition the following year. For the past three years, we have won the design award for our urban concept vehicles for their aesthetics, in addition to winning either first or second place for fuel economy. Maybe even more impressive is that for the last two years, we have set new American records for fuel economy in an urban concept vehicle. We currently hold the record for gasoline at 647 miles per gallon and for diesel at 489 miles per gallon. So clearly, we're doing something right in how we build these vehicles. But what is it that we do? How do we work with 15 to 20 students that have no background in designing, building, or fabricating, much less designing, building, and fabricating vehicles? And yet somehow, we end up with a car that wins. There's no doubt that we've grown. We've grown a lot in ability, in size, and in capability. The techniques that we're currently using, composite materials, unibody structures, even complete virtual modeling of the vehicle, it helps to improve and helps to perform better. But that's not what makes this a success. All of these tools that he just mentioned can help you get better fuel economy. But let me ask you a question. How many of you would be able to walk up to these kinds of pieces of equipment or those types of processes and immediately start doing that stuff without someone to show you how? Well, our students aren't any different. They don't come in knowing how to do this stuff. And these aren't skills that we really teach in our classes. Well, certainly we teach the theoretical background. And that's important. But what really sets our students apart is the fact that they gain a skill set that gets passed from one person to another. And that interpersonal interaction, that's a, a people problem to make sure that that happens. It's about faculty investing their time and efforts and abilities into students, and students then investing in other students. If we want to educate the leaders of tomorrow who tackle some of the grand challenges that we're going to face, we have to start introducing them to real problems. Real problems are messy, and there are seldom 100% perfect solutions for those problems. It is important that we get our students to grapple with those problems, and it's actually important that the students 
watch us as we grapple with those same problems. When we build and test these vehicles, there are lots of problems that arise, let's just put it that way. And we can't necessarily foresee them all. How the team ends up handling those problems is a reflection of how we handle them. One example of this was really in the first year that we were competing with the Blue Diamond. We had raced for an entire day and that we began to start having some issues and our starter ended up breaking this little plastic part that engaged the engine. Now, we were in California. We had no spare parts, no backup, no equipment. We're dead in the water. But the question is, were we? I managed to round up a block of aluminum, very similar to this. And it was in no way the right shape or the right size. But we had a file. <laughs> we spent the night filing on that block of aluminum until ultimately it looked like that original plastic part. What started off as a situation where we didn't even know what we were going to do the next day, now is a situation where the students learned they could do something totally different. One example, oh, excuse me. Everyone has been both student and teacher at some point in their lives. As a student, let me ask you this. Were you ever part of something that was big enough for someone to take notice? Did you ever want to be? Would you like to have seen your teachers and mentors approach problems that were so big that they may not have known the solution from the outset? Or maybe you felt like your teachers sort of avoided those things so that they wouldn't be embarrassed. As a teacher, let me ask you this. If you're a teacher, would you like to have some other way of evaluating your students and figure out, do they have skills and abilities that may not get measured with the standard academic measures? Or maybe you'd like to see them tackle a real problem and you sort of just be along on the side, giving them advice and pointers. Maybe you're saying, I have problems just with motivating my students. Well, maybe you could approach it instead of motivating them with grades or threats or motivational speeches, maybe you could, you could approach it by getting them excited about a problem. The question that comes up is, is this the most, most best way to be able to really solve the problems of the future? So as our society looks to that future, we begin to look and see, you know, what are these real challenges that we're going to face? Some of them are grand challenges, and they may even be predictable. But what are these little problems that we may not be able to foresee? When we look at future leaders, they're going to have to have a broad perspective and understanding that there's no single right answer, and there's also this idea of solution trade-offs. If we want to have people as a society who can make the future better, we're going to have to invest ourselves into them. And we don't feel that the typical classroom environment is really how this is done. <clears throat> we feel that the typical classroom environment is not where the leaders will be developed. Uh, a normal class presents material in one direction. The student is expected to be a sponge, and the problems that are presented are only require a few steps at most, and the students don't really get to the point where they're forced to think about a problem at a systems level. They even kind of get the feeling that the teacher always has all the answers or the answers are in the back of the book. When dealing with real problems, that is rarely the case. By working on systems like our vehicles, students get to experience real trade-offs. They get to watch as experts make real design decisions and struggle with problems for which there is no back of the book answer. Not all the problems that you will encounter can be foreseen. And for example, in our second year competing in the Urban Concept Division, our vehicle was finished on time and it looked great. So we put it in the trailer and we went off to the contest. But in the trailer on the way there, a strap came loose that was holding the car in place and it slammed into the back of the trailer. As a matter of fact, it slammed all over the place. It fractured the windshield, it broke the body off of the mounts to the frame, and it caused a lot of body damage, including ripping off the door. Well, what we watched our team do was kind of amazing. 
They rallied through text messages and cell phone calls and made a plan for what they would do when they got there. They worked all through the night, including a team that went back and made a new windshield for our vehicle. Another team worked on bodywork and paint. And another team tried to figure out how we're going to get the body back on the frame. It was really amazing to watch. But what was really amazing was after doing all that, the vehicle still won the design award for aesthetics, that competition. <laughs> now, the vehicle that we envision that's going to drive these future generations to really solve these real challenges is actually a very old educational model. A revival of the apprenticeship educational model is really what we use when we work with these students. Naturally, these students end up working with other students, which creates more leaders. And this interaction that we have from faculty to student, it allows teachers, it allows us to have a much larger impact on society than we ever could have on our own. We see this project as a vehicle, a focal point that enables us to execute a model of education that we feel has the capacity to instill in our students the types of qualities that are gonna allow them to be the solvers of the big problems of the future. It creates students that begin to take initiative and they develop leadership skills and communication skills as well as being aware of the issues that are around them. Now, this educational model is not without its own set of issues. Students taking initiative can be scary. And learning how to set the boundary for those students is actually pretty tough. There are also costs associated with doing what we've been calling this investing ourselves in the students. That means a lot of time and effort. And that's not free. A teacher must also grapple with this problem that you don't want to be too far on the authoritarian side, but you don't really want to be the student's buddy either. Somewhere in the middle, there's this idea of being a mentor. And over time, your students can actually start becoming your peer. Now that's a relationship that takes nurturing, and it takes time. But if it's done correctly, it has the capacity to have an enormous positive impact. Now, what many of you are probably asking at this point is, what are the steps to be able to do this apprenticeship educational model? The real question is, what is a real problem that you can invest yourself into students and then tackle together? We use this apprenticeship educational model as a way of developing a vehicle for the future. But that process results in developing leaders of the future. Thank you.